Stephanie Stomack. Thank you. Um, I am very, very excited to be back in the UK. If you follow me on Twitter, you know that I love to come over here. And like Phil said, this is my like final stop. I've been doing this sort of like mini conference tour the last week and a half. Um, I was speaking at NDC Porto, and then I went to Beyond Telerand, um, which is lovely. And now I'm ending my travels here in Leeds to deliver this new talk. Um, and while I was doing all this hopping between different cities and different countries, um, I always find it a little bit anxiety inducing because I just decide to use my mobile phone provider network from home. They tell me when I land in a new country, it should just work. Um, and it just selects whatever network is available and I just sort of pray that that always works. Um, and sometimes my connection is pretty weak and um, sometimes I have no connectivity at all. And so I was on the plane in airplane mode, um, lamenting how terrible I am at downloading content for when I'm offline. Um, and so I opened up the Duolingo app uh, because I'm learning German at the moment. And um, I wanted to see if it would work offline and it kind of did. It served me uh, two lessons uh, that were offline and then that was it. And so I was using the native iOS app and I've been starting to sort of deep dive into PWAs. Um, and so clicker is not gonna work, there we go, um, which are progressive web apps. Um, so I did some research to see if Duolingo had a PWA and they do, but they don't have an offline mode like at, at all. This is what happens when you're in airplane mode. Um, and those two lessons that I was able to access offline in the native app were only available because I was in the, I was on a free trial for Duolingo Plus, the paid native app. And now from a user experience perspective, uh, I think the fact that the PWA that doesn't have any offline experience at all is a little bit baffling to me because uh, why build a PWA if you're not going to leverage one of the most essential features that makes a PWA a PWA? And while I understand the motivation for Duolingo to provide uh, offline lessons behind a paid subscription, not including an offline mode for your PWA leaves a pretty big intentional gap um, in your user experience if you've chosen that route to build a PWA. Because PWAs are these wonderful things and they function like they're an installed native app on supportive platforms, um, but they function like a regular website in browsers uh, where they aren't supported as PWAs. So not including that offline mode uh, is really missing out on what makes a PWA a PWA because they combine the best of uh, web technologies while allowing developers uh, to use native application features. And there are a number of reasons why you might want to build a PWA, particu particularly if you want a cheap way to build for multiple platforms. You only have one code base to maintain. You have more distribution options. You actually uh, can be distributed through app stores. Um, you can push your updates out more efficiently because you're, all you're doing is updating a website. Uh, and they're, they're just faster. Uh, they're built to be performant um, with caching, uh, and they're available offline. So there are so many advantages uh, to building a proper PWA. And I feel like we always hear about the technical benefits of PWAs and, and the technical best practices. We've got tons of performance case studies, uh, the features you, could, you should consider when you're building a PWA. Um, but the one thing that I struggle to find a central resource on is user experience and visual design best practices for them. There is no like checklist out there for that, even though there are some things we absolutely need to think about um, that are PWA specific when we intentionally choose to go build one. Um, so I'm hoping this talk is sort of the start of that design and user experiences checklist so that we don't end up with an experience like this for your PWA. 
Now, in case you're not familiar with PWAs, um, I'm, I'm going to set some context. Um, I'm going to talk about the web application manifest multiple times throughout this talk, and all PWAs have one. And it's sort of the thing that makes building them great. Um, it's a JSON-based file, and it provides you with a centralized place to put metadata associated with a web application. And this metadata covers a range of different things. So it's where you can set your theme color and your icons. Uh, you even have the ability to scope a web application to a URL. And using this metadata, uh, user agents provide developers with the means to create user experiences that are more comparable to that of a native application. It's your central source of information for all your platforms. It tells your PWA how it can behave on each platform after it's installed, how it should display, is there a theme color, and so on. And this is whether you're on an Android device or a Windows computer or an iOS device. Um, and that's, that's really the beauty of a PWA. You can scale across so many different platforms with just one code base and your web app manifest, and it will recognize what, platform, what the platform supports and ignore whatever it doesn't. And so what I'm going to talk about today isn't necessarily how to design your PWA, uh, but what features are available for you to take advantage of to enhance your PWA experience um, that affects or contributes to the, the user experience or the interface of your PWA. Um, a lot of this is going to focus on the installable experience of a PWA, but some of it will be applicable uh, if you choose to keep your PWA in the browser UI. And so we're going to start with your app icon. Like if you want your PWA to feel like an actual app, uh, you need to design an icon and set it in your manifest. Now, PWAs have a set of install criteria that you must meet Like if you want browsers to show this in-browser install prompt. And one of those criteria is including an icon. Um, for Chromium, I think you have to provide at least two different icons of specific sizes just to get that prompt. And then beyond that requirement for installability, your icon is important for brand recognition. These are all the places that your icon can show up across all the different platforms, um, from the taskbar to the home screen. And people recognize their apps by their icons. So you want to ensure that you're designing something that stands out. Even when I think about how I scan my phone when I'm looking for an app, like I'm looking for that icon. I'm not reading the titles when I'm on my phone. Um, and on desktop taskbars, we don't even see that app name. So your icon design is incredibly important to consider because that's how your users are going to re-engage with your web app. It's really the first touch point of your PWA. And having that icon is also a major advantage from a user experience pers pers perspective. Um, you're offering the ability to add a shortcut, basically, from the home screen, uh, rather than having your users open up the browser, search for your site, go to their favorites to find it. Um, it it's one step. It streamlines the process uh, and it makes it quicker. And you're going to hear me say that a lot today, um, because that's one of the main advantages of PWAs. They're fast, and we want them to feel fast. Now, when it comes to icon design, the different platforms actually handle icons differently in terms of design. So Android has round corners compared to iOS that has rounded squares. And in your manifest file, there's a manifest property called purpose um, under your icons member. And this tells the browser how your icon can be used. And by default, the value uh, is any. And each platform will just take your icon and kind of do whatever it does to fit into the icon for the platform. And so for Android's platform, it will literally take your icon and just squish it even if it's just a square, um, and you'll end up with a shape inside of a white circle, which really isn't the most ideal if we're trying to be intentional about our design. Um, there is another property value that's 
somewhat recent um, that you can use for that purpose, and it's called Maskable. Um, and that enables your PWA to use something called adaptive icons. And so if you set your purpose to Maskable on Android, um, it'll actually fill up the whole shape, uh, which is much more aesthetically pleasing than having your icon sort of squished down to fit into a white circle. Um, the examples I've shown are from a web.dev article. Uh, you can visit that article for more information on, on how to use that and how those work. Uh, so for icons, they are required for your web app to be installable uh, to get that prompt from the browser. It's the first touch point of your PWA's interface and should stand out and reflect your brand. Um, it streamlines the user experience and then adaptive icons allow your icons to look much more design conscious across platforms. Next, uh, I'm gonna talk about theme color. And defining a theme color is another opportunity to tie, in, uh, tie into the visual design of your PWA, um, but in a really, really subtle way. Um, and so when you define a theme color, you're suggesting a color that becomes the default application color and a color that browsers should use to customize the surrounding interface. So if you're in the browser and not in a standalone display mode, um, that theme color is going to color your browser UI depending on what platform you're on. Uh, support and implementation for this right now does vary between different platforms and browsers um, and has changed a bit in the last uh, year. Outside of the browser, though, um, if we're in a standalone display mode, which I'll talk about the different display modes in a little bit, um, the theme color is much more impactful here, in my opinion. Um, if we look at a PWA on Windows, defining the theme color actually changes the title bar color. And when that title bar color is gray and just the sort of plain default system title bar, it makes our PWA feel somewhat disjointed. It doesn't quite match the style of our app, um, but when we're able to change that color, it feels a little bit more whole. Um, the UI between the system and the app isn't clashing and does feel a little bit more native app-like. Now, where the theme color shows up varies from platform to platform. Uh, on Android, it, I think it shows up when you switch PW, from your PWA to a different uh, screen. Um, and so it's very subtle, but it is a nice touch to sort of tie everything together from a brand perspective. Um, there's an app member or app manifest uh, member where you define the theme color. And this will apply again in any context where the web app manifest is applied. Now you can also set your theme color uh, in the head of your HTML with a meta tag, uh, but this is gonna override the theme color in your manifest uh, if you set it to a different color for whatever reason. Uh, if you want a theme color applied to the address bar of the browser UI before a user installs your PWA, you would include the meta tag for the theme color, but not all browsers support this, and some, again, only support it in the context of a PWA. And unlike the web app manifest, you'd have to include this on every single page that you want that theme color. Uh, so, Applying a theme color provides a more native uh, app-like experience in standalone mode. Uh, it's an opportunity to tie your primary brand color in, creating a little bit more cohesion um, at various touch points. And you would define this, again, via the web app manifest and a meta tag. Now, system fonts. Uh, this is probably one of the most impactful ways, in my opinion, to really make your PWA feel like a native app is to utilize system fonts. And instead of having to write like multiple lines of code for specific platforms, uh, there's a very easy way to do this. You can specify the default system font by setting your font family CSS property to system UI. And the other benefit of leveraging uh, the system UI fo I font um, apart from the design benefit of integrating with the platform more cohesively, there's a performance benefit as well. 
um, you're not having to request a set of fonts and serve those up to your users. The other thing is custom fonts also render differently across different uh, platforms, even in different browsers on the same uh, machine. So relying on the system UI font where possible uh, will reduce some of that overhead of managing and having to test across how does this look on a Windows machine, how does this look on an Android device. Um, it's just a little bit less overhead. So using system fonts is going to help create that platform-specific look and feel. Um, it'll feel like it's for Mac. It'll feel like it's for Windows uh, by leveraging those system fonts. Um, it also reduces that overhead on managing a custom font across different platforms and those rendering differences. And there's a performance benefit. Now. When you're thinking about enhancing your website to become a PWA, um, there are a few different things that you really need to consider uh, when it comes to how your web app is going to be displayed in different contexts. And the first is how, how you want to display your app after it gets installed if you're going for that installable experience. Uh, you can have your PWA remain in the browser UI, but if you don't want that experience, whatever display mode you choose uh, may have some user experience consequences that you need to be aware of and plan for. Uh, once again, display mode is something you set in the web app manifest under the display member. And there are four display modes that you can choose from. The standalone display mode makes your PWA look and behave uh, the most like a platform-specific application. It will open in a different window from the browser, and it hides all the browser UI elements, like the address bar, the back button, so you lose all that navigation. Um, and in this mode, your application also can have its own icon in the application launcher. Now, the full screen display mode, this takes up the entirety of the display area available. And this, again, hides all the browser UI elements. So no navigation, no browser Chrome, nothing. The minimal UI display mode, this gives your PWA a similar experience to the standalone display mode. Um, it opens in its own window but the application still retains a minimal set of browser UI controls. Um, and the UI that is retained, uh, once again, will vary between browsers and platforms. So you want to be sure to test um, if you're using minimal UI. And then the browser display mode, uh, this is the default for PWAs if you don't set any of the other ones. Uh, it retains the entire browser experience with all your browser UI and your web app will not be installable. And so if a particular display mode um, isn't supported by a platform, it will fall, fall back to the next supported display mode. And then, as I mentioned, with full screen and standalone mode, um, we, because we lose all of our browser Chrome, uh, we lose our back uh, and forward buttons, our home button, all that navigation. Um, so we have to think about what that means for navigating within our web app. Um, I was writing an article on display modes for PWAs and came across this rather aptly timed post from Jeremy Keith um, about media queries and display modes. Um, and he was talking about how he has a, P a PWA that he set to standalone mode if it gets installed. And when on small screens, on phone screens, folks will need a back button to navigate. But you can also install PWAs on desktops as well. So his media query was only giving people who were on a mobile phone a back button, uh, and users on desktop had no navigation. Um, so it's important to remember that while, yes, PWAs are probably thought of as more something that gets installed on your phone, you can install them on desktop too. And so we need to consider what that means for our user experience. And so in those full screen and standalone modes, just ensure you have 
some form of navigation for your users if you don't have a typical menu available for whatever reason. And also a question, how is your layout gonna change in those modes? Do you need to make any design shifts? Um, be sure to test your design in whatever mode you're planning to launch it in. I know full screen will take up the full screen and there might be maybe too much space at the top and you wanna adjust that. And um, this is how Jeremy solved his back button issue. There are actually media queries available to target your different uh, PWA display modes. So in Jeremy's case, he used display mode standalone and added uh, display inline to his back button uh, to display it only in that context, only when the user had installed an app and it was in standalone mode. Um, and that would be both available on desktop and mobile PWAs. So there are four different display modes to choose from. Not all display modes are supported by all browsers or platforms, but there is a fallback cascade. Um, some display modes have no browser UI. So if you pick that mode, just think about uh, what that means for navigating through your web app. And the next thing I want to talk about uh, is it's related to display modes, but isn't its own display mode, uh, but it offers even more control over the title bar area of your PWA when you're in standalone mode. And this makes it feel even more native app-like. Um, and it's a feature called Window Controls Overlay, which is fairly recent. Uh, I'd say in the last six months, finally, um, I don't think it's experimental in Chrome and Edge anymore. But uh, like in most of our native applications, like the title bar is used pretty frequently. There's all sorts of stuff that gets put in there. And previously with PWAs, uh, like it, this area was unable to be customized beyond that theme color that we talked about before. Uh, but with this new feature, you're able to access that area and customize it with CSS. So it's opening up everything except for those system UI buttons that we, we need to retain for our window. And there's a manifest member for it, uh, which we would declare after our display mode. Um, and to be clear, this isn't actually overriding our display mode. It's still gonna show up in standalone mode, but we're saying if window controls overlay is supported, provide this enhanced title bar experience in that mode. And there are a few criteria that need to be met um, for window controls overlay to work. Um, the app can't be opened in the browser. It has to be open in a, a separate window. Uh, the manifest has to include that display override. Uh, the PWA has to be running on a desktop uh, and the current origin has to match the origin for which the PWA was installed. And so when it comes to positioning and styling things in the title bar, we have a couple new environment variables, which I just have to say, I've been uh, working with environment variables for my dual screen talks and building demos with them. And they're so great for scaling when it comes to designing for different sizes and, and thinking about the future. Um, I could give a whole lightning talk on them because I think they're really cool. Um, but we have these environment variables for the title bar. And so title bar area X gives us the distance from the left of the viewport to where the title bar appears. Uh, title bar area Y is from the top. And then we just have our height and our width. And so this is how we position our content in the title bar. Once you have all that set though, uh, you're not done. And I've taken this example here from the web.dev documentation on window controls overlay. Um, I've got my customized title bar with a, with a search bar, but once I've turned on window controls overlay on a platform that supports it, my title bar no longer becomes draggable. So I can't grab the window and move it around, which isn't a great experience. Uh, so we need to add the app region CSS property and specify that I want the whole title bar to be draggable except for that search bar input. Um, so this is both a user interface and user experience consideration. Because if my users can't grab the PWA and move it around, again, 
poor, poor user experience, and it's probably going to lead to some confusion about why they can't move that around. Um, so leverage Windows Control Overlay. Uh, it makes your PWA even more app-like by accessing that title bar. It's available on desktop, and then if it's not supported on a specific platform, you're just not going to get that customized title bar beyond uh, the, the theme color that you defined previously. Um, and now let's look at some items to consider for the PWA user experience. And these are, in my opinion, probably the most vital pieces to consider uh, because a bad user experience can leave such a lasting impression that people can will abandon your web app and, and never come back to it. And, and we don't want that. We want them to come back. And so one of the selling points of PWAs is that they're fast and performant. So our content should reflect performance and speed. Um, your PWA is not the spot for flashy distractions and unnecessary content. In general, PWAs provide people with the means to perform certain tasks or access information quickly and efficiently. Um, so one of the questions you want to ask is what is it that your users are most commonly trying to accomplish when they're in your PWA? And then make your PWA experience focused around that. Um, and then reduce content clutter where possible. Ask, how can I streamline this? Um, what can you do to your user interface to make the user flow go more quickly? Now, I have the Starbucks PWA up here as an example. And from a content and user interface uh, perspective, they've gone extremely light. Um, their navigation, when expanded, only consists of the ordering menu, uh, your rewards, gift cards, your account information, and the ability to find a store. Um, but their ordering menu is first on the list after you open the navigation. So we can assume that, we, that Starbucks knows that when someone's in their PWA, they want to order a coffee. Um, and so once you get to your item of choice to order, um, that Add to Order button, which I'm standing in front of, um, is right there. And it's ready to go. Um, and it even stays in that position as you scroll down. So it's never out of view. And just that small detail makes such a huge difference, in my opinion, in the experience. Like I keep thinking of uh, when I go and order food on other apps um, or on a website and have to scroll all the way up to edit something um, and then scroll all the way back down uh, to get back to the Add to Order button. Um, and so like just small things like that uh, can have the most impact. And then I mentioned reducing clutter earlier, um, especially if you're really trying to deliver that app-like experience. Uh, lose the footer, especially if you're in like a, the standalone display mode. Um, Twitter, as both a website and a PWA, doesn't even have a footer. Um, but if I'm looking here at a native application, especially on a desktop, there aren't any footers. Like most of our websites have them, but apps don't. So drop that footer um, in your PWA if you have that installable experience. And then the Twitter PWA is also like a really great example of adapting based on whether or not you're on desktop. Um, and decluttering depending on your screen size. So in the desktop app, we have like the nine icons and a tweet button on one side, and then we have the what's happening sidebar on the other. But then on mobile, we get just the timeline, and then we get our tweet button. Again, similar to the Starbucks app, that tweet button is like ever present um, and ready for you to tap immediately to send your unfiltered shower thoughts out onto the interweb without thinking twice. Um, and we even have reduced navigation. So with the most essential bits like there at the bottom, then so those are front and center. And then all that extra clutter um, actually gets tucked away and hidden until I press my Twitter avatar. 
And so it's not just about responsive design and having a site that adapts to whatever screen that you're on, um, but it's going even a step further to create focus on the tasks that are priority to your users. So less is more. Focus on those main tasks or information that you, your users need. Uh, lose the footer to reduce clutter and give a more app-like experience, especially if you're in a standalone mode. Um, different experiences on desktop versus mobile are fine as you take advantage of more space. Um, and if someone's on your mobile PWA, they probably have a more focused task that they're trying to get to as opposed to on desktop. So bubble up those key UI elements to help them complete those much more quickly. I keep talking about how PWAs are fast. They're inherently fast but we can make them seem even faster if we put some thought into our interaction design. And the first thing that I like to suggest is adding skeleton UI for loading. And skeleton UI, if, if you're unfamiliar, is a wireframe-like UI um, that is used in place of a loading spinner and provides a much more seamless transition between a user taking an action and a page load compared to just a loading spinner. Like a blank page with a spinner in the middle isn't really giving me um, an indication of what's to come. Like what can I expect to load? But with Skeleton UI, you're basically providing a wireframe of the page layout. So it's almost as if you're prepping the user um, for what's to come and provides a bit of a more solid transition state. Um, I found this great quote though about Skeleton UI um, on my way here yesterday from Tim Cadlick. Um, he says, if you can display content right away, by all means, do that instead. So don't include skeleton UI for the sake of including skeleton UI. If your content loads fast, then there's no point in adding that extra bit to indicate loading, but it's really vital to test to see if that is something that you need to include. Um, the whole write-up is really good, so I highly recommend going to check that out. And then if a user performs an action, um, providing some sort of visual cue that the interaction was successful um, helps with perceived performance. Even if the page load or, or whatever comes after that interaction isn't immediate, the immediate interaction on the element that I pressed, that still communicates some level of performance to, to the user and doesn't disrupt that flow. Um, I use the Microsoft Authenticator app, which isn't a PWA, but it drives me absolutely nuts because when I go to copy my 2FA code, um, I expect some sort of feedback to let me know that I have pressed copy. Um, and I don't get that feedback at all. And there's a little bit of a lag um, between me pressing copy and then that I get a little UI dialog that pops up um, that says it was copied. But that lack of immediate feedback every single time like disrupts my flow and, and slows me down uh, because I'm waiting for that, that dialogue to pop up and I'm unclear if I was actually successful. And so even though it's, it's only for a second, um, it still feels slow. And with PWAs, again, they're fast and efficient. So we want our interactions to feel fast and efficient and immediately responsive to us. Um, next, integrate with features to make tasks easier and faster to complete in your PWA. One of my favorite examples of this is that PWAs work with the payment request API. Um, so if the main user flow for a project that involves buying something and needing to go through a checkout process, thinking about what you can include feature-wise uh, that makes that process as pain-free as possible is great. Um, use things like autofill to fill in the, in the details and use web payments. Uh, I'll tell you as a consumer, the absolute joy I get out of using Apple Pay to complete a transaction um, is maybe a little bit messed up because I'm excited about how quickly I can spend my money. Um, but when I see that option available to me, it is the most seamless experience possible. And, and I remember that. I remember that when I'm using a website or an app to check out and they don't have that integration available and how much slower that feels. And so the easier and faster 
it is to complete a task with these integrations, that experience is gonna be memorable and keep people coming back to your web app. Um, this website uh, is what, what can PWAs do and it provides a list of all the platform features that you can actually integrate uh, with PWAs to make them feel like a native application. Um, some of them don't necessarily relate to interaction, but I want to emphasize like we do have a robust set of features to take advantage of um, if you need them that we wouldn't normally have access to if you were just building a normal website. And now, finally, um, this is our sort of our last consideration, our last best practice coming back around um, to where I started. Um, don't forget an offline mode. This is one of the most important features that PWAs leverage is caching and the ability to function offline. Now, not all of the functionality of our PWAs may be available when something happens and, and your network connection gets um, disrupted. But from a user experience and retention standpoint, it really feels like a missed opportunity to not provide an offline experience. Whether it's keeping cached content available or simply providing information that their network is down in a thoughtful way um, and indicating that it's actually not your website erroring, erroring or your PWA um, that's having an issue, um, but you're actually saying, Oh no, like your network connection is down. So offline mode is like a keystone feature of PWAs. Uh, there's a great case study on Trivago, uh, which is a travel app, and what happened when they built their PWA. Uh, they saw a lot of their numbers jump across the board, uh, but their PWA has an offline experience. And when people's network connection was interrupted, they saw 67% of those people come back online within their PWA and re-engage with the PWA. It's a lot of returning customers. So in offline mode, like it works. And so you can handle your offline mode in a couple of different ways. Uh, one of the things you can do is just provide a custom offline page in place of the browser one, um, like we saw with the Duolingo app. Um, and this allows you to control that experience a bit more until the network is restored. And so in this instance, you're gonna uh, pre-cache a custom offline page, um, have it reflect your app's branding, um, and then show it when the user is offline and navigates to uh, an uncached page. And so again, it gives a sense that your app at least knows what's going on. And then the other option is to proactively cache certain content in your app um, that remains unchanged uh, for long intervals. Um, these are things like banner images, authentication state, media for playback, and the list does go on. So proactively cache them and use them even if your users are still um, online as this will improve performance and platform specific behaviors. And so depending on your PWA strategy, this may be the way you wanna go if you want to prioritize that offline experience. Take advantage of service workers. Like I can't find any PWA documentation that doesn't have a service worker reference or information because again this is this is one of the key features of a PWA that it can work offline so create an offline experience if for nothing else to delight your users so that they get so that if they get shown that oops your offline page they go oh okay cool it knows that my network connection is interrupted that's kind of cool i'll come back online when i have that network restored so it's more control over your app's experience, and I, that shouldn't be ignored lately. Uh, so to recap, use Skeleton UI for transition states if needed. Um, integrate with platform APIs and features to speed things up. Um, create offline experiences that either keep people engaged or provides information while they're offline until their connection is restored. And so if you're thinking, I have a lot to think about, I've actually created a little GitHub repo with all these different best practices for you. Um, it's in its first version, and so I expect to have it evolve a little bit.
And so we're here at the end now. Um, and a beautiful web app isn't just about uh, the visual design. Beautiful is also defined as of a very high standard, excellent. And we live in a world that is becoming increasingly uncertain for many. So we should sweat the details. We should be intentional about specific features that we include in our PWAs, particularly the ones that affect user experience. PWAs are an opportunity to deliver intentional and well thought out experiences for our users that help them complete a task or find in critical information as quickly as possible so that they can get back to whatever is happening in their life. And that, in my opinion, is what makes a web app beautiful. Thank you.